really, really excited about this next panel. Um, there's been so much conversation. I think we've all seen the impact of, uh, of Kelly, Kelly Slater's wave uh, at the ranch and what the WCL is, is trying to do. And whether you're a fan of man-made waves or not, you, you can't deny that we're sitting on the precipice of a really exciting time. So we've assembled a pretty stellar crew, some great perspective from all aspects. Uh, please welcome to the stage panels for today, John Luff, who is the president and founder of Surf Park Central and a leader in development consulting and media for the emerging surf park industry. Former pro surfer Shane Beshin, who works with technology company City Wave and is a partner also at Playground Surf. Blake Hess, who is the general manager at the world's largest man-made wave a destination, Enlin in Texas. And Tony Finn, who is a wakeboard legend, has a, a pretty, uh, pretty sick uh, tantrum to blind, I've been told. Uh, see? Just keeping throwing it out. And a partner at BSR Surf Resort, also in Texas. Welcome to the stage, you guys. <laughs> There you go. And is this, are you going to be, you got your clicker? There you go. All right, good. Okay. We got it, actually. Oh, how are we feeling, gentlemen? Awesome. Yeah, slightly rattled. <laughs> I think we do have some, uh, some tequila coming, by the way. We can, uh, yes! Yeah. Oh, Whoa, sorry. Let's settle down. Are we live? I do have to say, this is the first uh, starting off a panel with yeah. a round of shots. Well, we just, I, I think we, uh, a toast to the future. There we go. Sorry, you guys. This is kind of rude, but uh, we'll get you some after. Cheers, you guys. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. 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 Yeah. Um, I, this was Tony's idea. Oh, I think I just threw up in my mouth. Yeah. All right. That'll do it. So I know you guys, uh, you, came, um, you came with some, uh, some videos, and we're going to be obviously talking... Uh, get into a lot of the details about everything that's been happening. I know you've been uh, with, with this industry right from the, the, the get-go in terms of trying to get organized, but uh, I just want to start the question, like, in terms of everything that you've seen that's transpired, where do you see the surf park and man-made surf destination industry going next, if you had to go out five to ten years from now? Yeah, I think it's going to be, let's see, Mike World. Yeah. No worries. I think it's going to be big. Um, I think this, this industry is going to have an impact on everyone and all the brands represented in this room. Um, and I think there's been a lot of this conversation and dialogue around authentic, artificial, real, fake. But I think what really matters is that the stoke is real. And this next video that we're going to play is kind of captures that better than anything I could say. But we need sound, sound to make it work. <laughs> Look at that thing. We're in Waco, Texas. The whip I was with Seth and Rob Kelly, Samantha and Tyler. It's pretty sick and it's awesome. It's really fun. Dude, I'm so ready to go shred. I'm like stoking. I'm be like, yeah. So sad. Come on it. There's air sections that are really fun. And they could do like any direction, left and right. And the best where I was like on the wedge, it was like it had so much space. Like it was like a stand-up arrow from it. Keeps coming. The waves. It's like never ends. It's amazing. Seriously. It's pretty awesome to be here. It's everything. That, yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> Shane and I were watching that earlier, and I'm like, that's kind of unbelievable. No, he's like, no, it's like, that's legit, right? Yeah. No, yeah. Watching little kids stand up in man made barrels is incredible. The stoke is real. Uh, well, I'd love to get your perspective, Shane, in terms of I know there's a big push on the competition side. I think we all saw Seth's uh, crazy, crazy flip. Uh, in, in a wave pool that kind of blew up the internet. But I'd love to, in terms of like the tech side and what it, what it can offer competitively, because you, you bring an interesting perspective as a former competitor yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, I'm sure we all watched the Slater event, which was really cool and, you know, obviously probably had some adjustments to make there, but, uh, you know, just watching the Waco footage and, 
you know, just seeing what is capable is incredible, you know, and yeah. um, I know Sam McIntosh lo- uh, left today, but he showed me a video of Albie from yesterday free surfing after he had surfed the pool and he had stuck something probably one of the best moves he's ever stuck so because you've always had a good analytical mind when you talk about the coaching you've done the way you you break down so you see a lot of potential there well yeah Yeah. i mean it was literally like saw it like he went to the wave pool and then went home and in the ocean stuck his best trick he's ever done maybe yeah so i think yeah for sure it's gonna reflect on the performance and i just think in the future there'll just be more and more waves like like surf spots, you know, and there's going to be a, a plethora of variety to choose from. And the conversation kind of went there yesterday, I think, via, I think, Bobby, when, it, when he was talking in terms of hitting a broader audience. And I would want to ask you, Blake, what, what have you seen where you're at in terms of, are, are these just, you know, hardcore surfers or what's the makeup? That's what it started out as. I mean, when we opened up Enlin. You know, right away we got the surfers coming out. Everybody wanted to see what it was. It was something new, something exciting. But uh, our wave is split up into three sections, more beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And the beginner and intermediate lacked at the first opening. You know, we had to get people out there to learn it. And we've already seen this year, we've only been open for about 40 days. And we've seen over 55% um, of the passes that we sold last year in our beginner area already sold in this short period. So we've seen the new surfers getting involved in, in it is so much higher than we ever expected, and it's just just bell curving straight up. And we've got, uh, I believe, a little little footage. We kind of back that up. If we, yeah, I think this yeah. next clip is just kind of a, a promo reel at Enlin, but you can see it's it's not just focused around you know the the high end surfer. It's about everybody getting into the sport and enjoying it. That's impressive. Like you see that, it's like the Dave and Busters of the future. <laughs> so. it, it is on every wave we send, it, and we send a wave every two minutes, and it's, there can be 100 people on that wave, and not all of them are your high-end surfers. You know, most of them are yeah. your beginner intermediate. so it's just going to... You almost get more stoked, or I should say enthralled, when you see the novices and the, and the and people that are so foreign to it. When you see where they're, they're hitting that, they have that aha moment, right? It's exactly. I mean, when you see somebody surf and catch a wave for the first time, everybody probably remembers the first wave they ever caught. And, you know, you see that 100 times over every single day out of Enlin. It's just so inspiring. And I, I know everyone's always thinking opportunity, opportunity. I mean, Tony, what do you think, uh, or I should say, where, where do the opportunities lie for, for, the, for the retailers uh, to partner with park developers? Because I know there's, initially there was some hesitancy. It's Yeah, so the... So, thank you. <laughs> this, is, this, is, I'm, this is me surfing at Inland. Yeah. So one of the things about us, we're all bros, and the, so we can surf at everybody else's wave, and they can surf at our wave, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> but, um, but so the opportunities are huge for retailers and brands to partner. So at Waco, what we wanted to do was we wanted to combine the um, authenticity of Southern California surf culture and beach culture with the, like, uh, Texas hospitality, Southern hospitality. So what? So first thing that happened was uh, Shane Magnuson decided to move from Oceanside to Waco, and everybody was like, "I kept on telling people, yeah, Shane's moving to Waco," <laughs> and they're like, "What? <laughs> no, he's not, right. not dude." Yeah. I'm like, "No, dude, Shane is moving to Waco because he has the sick setup. He's got a Stuart, the owner of uh, Barefoot Ski Ranch, gave him an awesome." cottage right on the water on his own private lake it's about i don't know 200 yards from the wave he surfs every day perfect surf so he's super stoked so we have shane who's got super authentic hawaiian california surf culture and he's then, struggling is what you're saying yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a he's so life. bummed right now <laughs> okay yeah and and then and then we also when then we just we got surf ride um who's a fantastic shop uh, tons of history and in, in surfing i don't know how long they've been open like 30 or 40 years or something like that 
And um, they have great shops in Solana Beach and Oceanside. And Surfride decided to open up the, a store at BSR Surf Resort right at, I mean, it's literally like 20 yards from the left barrel. So it's like oceanfront in Waco, killer. So there's a lot of opportunity for retailers. And then from a brand standpoint, I mean, these kids that you just saw, like on your video and the people that are surfing already in, uh, in Waco, they might know your brands, but they don't love your brands. They don't. They might have bought something before, but they don't really understand your brand. And so I feel like there's a, like you can get involved and get these kids immersed in your brands. And I think the people who go after it early and hard are gonna are gonna win. It, that's I mean, when you see the footage, I, I have to ask you, John. Then why why aren't there more parks operating at this point? Is it is it just it's because it's in the gestation phase, or because it seems like the success and the numbers don't lie? Yeah. yeah. So before I answer that question, yeah. just going back to to what Tony was talking about, and a lot of these people don't necessarily know your brand yet, but I think there's some really grassroots ways to get into working with these parks and working with the local cities where the parks are located. Um, just one example, I mean, a lot of us here from Southern California grew up around surf PE programs. I mean, this is something you can come in as a brand and help subsidize, sponsor, or help basically take local kids out of the local schools that might not have the opportunity or the cash in the bank to go and buy their own surf sessions. I mean, a lot of these parks are not, you know, the easiest access in terms of financial means, like 100 bucks an hour, 95 bucks an hour, 60 bucks an hour. But you as a brand could come in and sponsor a surf PE program in a local city, and all of a sudden every kid who's in school now has access to surf. And the cities are actually getting behind this now. I mean, the timing's perfect with the Olympics. That's something I think that can be leveraged when you're talking to a city. And I think, you know, we all talk about how do you, how do you take surfing where it's never been before, whether that's Waco, Texas, whether that's Austin, whether that's Kansas City, it doesn't really matter. I mean, kids are gonna get stoked on surfing. Kids aspire to surf everywhere. You guys know that better than anybody. And I think one of the best ways is a grassroots program with getting kids into surf early in their life and stoking them out. Um, but now back to your question. Yeah. So the, it's taken a decade plus for a lot of these technologies to get to where they are today. A lot of what you're seeing in pictures and videos now has been in the works for a long time. Um, and the, the capital behind it, it's equity heavy. It's hard to get a loan from Bank of America on building a wave pool. <laughs> Try and explain that to a loan officer. Um, there's not a blueprint for doing this either. I mean, a lot of these guys, and Blake and his team are a testament to that. They've done an amazing job of going where no one's gone before. And you can't look at 10-year historical financials on a surf park. They don't exist. And so putting the whole puzzle together on the front end, whether it's the financial side or whether it's the regulatory side, trying to work with the whole real estate development process that goes into this, yeah. that's held a lot of this back. But there's also something to be said about computing power and being able to simulate what these waves can do before you go physically build one. Because now, what you can do on a computer, you can get pretty darn close to simulating what's actually going to happen when you scale it up. And in the past, people were spending millions of dollars on science projects. Ron John Surf Park, if any of you are familiar, <laughs> yeah. from 2006. Yeah. That didn't go so well. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of people lost money, and it scared a lot of people. But now it's getting to the point where the technology's there, the money's there, this whole bricks and mortar change in real estate is there. And uh, the retail guys, I mean, you're seeing Macy's, Sears, Kmart, whatever, big boxes are opening up, and the retail guys are like, what do I do with my shopping mall? It's, do I stay a shopping mall or do I become an entertainment district? What gets people out of their homes and brings people together? Well, you bring up a great and, point. You know, when you talk about, Shane, with what you're working with, the, the, you can literally drop a wave in the middle between two escalators. Yeah, and that, it's, the, it's an amazing amount of intimacy that, <laughs> with, that you can have with someone that's just learning how to surf versus uh, the spectators. Yeah, totally. And like I was saying, there's going to be different ways for different scenarios. And I've been to Inland and I've been to Snowdonia. And I've surfed, obviously, the city way venues, the portable one in Germany, and recently just went to Israel and they did a permanent one. I saw the photo, it, incredible sun deck, whoa. Trying to zen out, yeah. trying to zen out. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, you know. So I think you know each one has its place, and with the city wave, 
It's still a different surfing experience, more of like a river wave surfing experience, but you're still riding a real surfboard, which was really important to me as far as supporting the surf industry, you know? And I think the energy of all these parks as they move further inland will definitely help the, the entire industry in some way or another. And I think it just comes back to what Kevin's um, uh, keynote was about, is just fun, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I think, you know, in the beginning, it's like this or that, waves and fake or ocean and wave pools. And I think once you, you know, abolish all those small-minded thoughts and look at the big picture of just more fun, more excitement, more business. And I think that's a, a key thing. And you touched on it a little bit, but maybe maybe a little bit more uh, go in depth in terms of the, the coaching training aspect. Because I know a lot of the, with the with the city waves, it's like you said, it's the first time someone's getting on a wave, but there, you, you see the, po the true potential on a coaching level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, just on the city wave alone, I've taught my younger son, Coda, like how to do front side carves, you know, because mm -hmm. he, like on one run, he'll do freaking 10 of them, you know, and it's yeah. like the next time he goes, it's like, hey, you know, try this or try that. And just in Israel, like there was a girl learning how to surf and, you know, her first few runs, she was barely making it to the other side of the wall. And we gave her a few pointers, went to lunch, came back, and she's doing full roundhouse cutbacks and ripping, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just think the whole movement is going to be beneficial to surf and and the future of the industry. You kind of forget where you are when it's going down. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> and it's such a different experience, yet you're still riding on water. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we all love, you know, riding on water, that floating feeling if you're in powder or on a skateboard or surfing or wake surfing or wakeboarding, or now there's all a huge river surfing movement. So I think, and even wake surfing, you know, like you can go and watch videos of Josh Kerr wake surfing with his daughter. No, and yeah, properly ballast his boats. It. I think Donovan's even coming out with a Mastercraft signature boat that like it controls the ballast with a switch. You don't even have to fill the bags anymore. But Yeah, yeah so um, I, I think just the urge to have fun and ride on water and, and yeah. surf or board or whatever you want to call it is, is the main Well, I know, uh, I mean, there's thousands out there that appreciate you guys who are kind of the first to, to kind of jump in into this. But like, let me ask you in terms of kind of lessons learned, because you, you got in early. As a general yeah. manager, maybe lessons and highlights. Well, it's, I mean, it's been a whirlwind for two years that I've been with Enlin, but it's, it's amazing. We talk about the different waves and the different features, and it's kind of nice because the technology coming out, there's so many different advantages to the different systems and what they give, but probably the biggest highlight, and you know, we have a video of it, is the ability to do different stuff that you can't necessarily do in the ocean. Not to take away from the ocean, because obviously it's, it's where the roots are and everything else, but to do stuff. and. Uh, where we've seen that the most beneficial is with adaptive surfing or surf therapy. And, you know, we have a group out there almost every week with different disability or different reason for doing it. And it's amazing because, you know, we can sit there and we get on the radio and say, hey, hold the wave for, for another 30 seconds. We're not in position yet. Things like that where we're breaking down barriers that would be difficult to get out there. I mean, they're not worried about uh, getting in the ocean. You know, I mean, some people have a fear of sharks. I mean, it's, it's real, but it's, it's, you know, not not something that you have to worry about in the, in the lagoons that we build. And, and that helps a lot of people that would never get out there to, to be out there and do it. And, and again, the frequency and to be able to send it um, makes that learning process so much quicker. And as everybody knows, the quicker the success rate is, the more self-confidence it builds and then the more, more of these programs build. It's a, it's a side of it. I think a lot of us as surfers, we're so focused on we want a barreling technical you know, progressive wave, but there's that side of it that's the, it's the entry point, and then it's also all the things that we do, like from Waves for Warriors, and yeah, yeah. It, it definitely opens that, that, ga that gate in a very more, uh, I think. Um, it's, it's amazing. I think, John, if the next slide, if you don't mind playing that video, it kind of shows some of the different ones from, you know, hearing impaired, seeing impaired, disabled, this kind of shows it all.
That, I, I'm, right? <laughs> I get goosebumps every time I see that video. I showed it to a couple of our coaches at, at Enlin and literally brought tears to their eyes and just seeing some of the stuff that you can do that's not, not possible elsewhere. It's, yeah. And I want to remind, that's in Texas. Yeah, that's in Texas. So <laughs> I'll, let me, I'll ask you, <laughs> like, why, why Texas? Why has it become like the, like the default <laughs> capital well, of uh, <laughs> wave parks? So in, my ca in, in the case of Waco, it's a pretty interesting story. So when, um, like, so the guy that owns uh, Barefoot uh, BSR Surf Resort, his name is Stuart Parsons, and he already had uh, a wakeboard park, a, the world's longest lazy river, and a super, super sick water slide. That's a video went viral, got 44 million views. It's, it's incredible. You gotta check it out on YouTube, uh, BSR Royal Flush, it's called. But anyway, so, me and him were doing a wakeboard demo, and after the wakeboard demo, this is like four years ago, we're just chilling and drinking some beers and you know, maybe partaking in some other substances, and we're just kind of chilling. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and, and he goes, hey, Tony, check this out. I just got ranked number seventh in water parks in the country. And I'm like, wow, that's super cool. And then I go, hey, you want to be ranked number one in the country? And he goes, yeah. I go, let's build a wave pool. He goes, all right, let's do it. And that's how Waco. That was the impetus, really. That was, yeah, that was a true yeah. story about what happened. Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then after that, and then on a wider scope of wide Texas, I think, you know, even though it's a little bit of a struggle, but compared to building like in California or New York or Florida, it's a lot easier. You, the, there's just less regulations. Stuart a lot of land. A lot yeah. of land. Yeah. Land's a lot cheaper. Yeah. And I just think, like, you sort of feel like you're in Mexico. Like, there's a little bit of lack of regulation to what you're, what, what I'm used to, like, in Southern Cal. Austin's a little different sometimes. I know, I know. <laughs> but I know that's why I said you had a little bit of struggle. Yeah. But still, you were able to get the water. You were able sure. to do the yeah. park. But now I feel like since there are two that are, you know, you know getting, well, three, sorry, Kelly's uh, um, Inland and, and BSR Surf Resort, there's going to be a lot of energy behind it. And I think that right. at this point... It's kind of hit that tipping point where I feel like a lot are going to start happening in every state of the country. So, I mean, it kind of gets back to the economics then. Like, what are the, what are the biggest hurdles that are facing these wave parks right now? Because I know you, you get to hear all sides. Right. Yeah. So, there, there's a lot of different views and perspectives on this out there, and there's a lot of different just opinions, period. And what the interpretation in one city is to the next uh, can be black and white. Um, but there's a lot of different sizes, shapes. There's no one size fits all surf park or surf pool or wave pool for that matter. Um, there's everything from tennis court size city waves, which Shane and I are working on together in various cities across the US, North America. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum, such as Kelly's up in Lemoore, which many of you have probably seen and ridden. And doing something like that that's open to the public, it's, it's not an easy feat to pull it off, and it's a lot of money. Um, so some of the biggest hurdles right now, it's, there's the regulatory side, and then there's the, call it, risk tolerance side of investors also. Um, that goes back to just what we talked about earlier, where, I mean, you can't, there's no guarantee that this is going to work in all cases. There's higher likelihood it can work when you do something like this in Southern California, but then you deal with the whole public opposition side when you're trying to educate people that, let's say a surf pool might only use the amount of water that a golf course does in a year on a single hole. A single hole on a golf course, on average in California, uses more water in a year than any of these surf pools, surf parks that we're talking about. You, you actually get resistance just for the, the amount of water that's... Yeah, and it's it, perceived. It's a yeah. matter of perception. Right. Like a lot of people see this giant lagoon and they think it's extremely water intensive. It's definitely water intensive, but when you start comparing it to things that they are familiar with, I mean, look at Coachella Valley. There's 140 yeah. golf courses, yeah. and you, the amount of water they use, it's absurd. It's well, Bellagio yeah. Fountain. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a waste of water. Yeah. And that should be a wave. <laughs> yeah. imagine, totally. a, imagine a wave at right. Bellagio. Yeah. And at the strip right there? Yeah. That would be insane. One thing, yeah. There's, there's a ton of different <laughs> business models, too. I mean, there's not, there's not a one, you know, one business model that's the magic ticket to this. It's, some people look at this just to put heads in beds in a hotel. Some people are looking at this as kind of a high-end exclusive residential anchor, swap out the golf course, throw in the wave yeah. pool. And it's happening now, it's just gonna take time, and it, it also takes time to, to get the cities, the, the people who can say yes, that you can do this, regardless of money and expertise to execute. If the cities 
resist and if the public resists in some ways for a variety of reasons, it's going to be really hard to pull it off. But I think it's definitely got the momentum behind it now. And yeah. we're going to see a lot more soon. That's, that's, good, that's good news. I, I think on that same note, with yeah. anything new, there's always some skepticism and people that are afraid, legislature and things like that. I mean, for us, when we first opened our park, they wanted to classify it as a swimming pool. They wanted us to, to live up to the same standards as, as a county pool. And to do that with 20 million gallons of water is, is impossible. So, you know, there's been a strong push, and it's not just from us, it's from people like Crystal Lagoons that are building resorts, not necessarily for surfing, but the same type of sport lagoon, and they're making a new classification for those things. But it's, it's I mean, from top to bottom, there's a lot of stuff. It's not just making the wave and the technology and that, but also how do you maintain this, how do you keep it safe, what, what levels do we have to do for, you know, treating the water, things like that, all kinds of things that most people don't think about. They just see the wave and start frothing. Yeah, well, overall, too, there's always been a, a lot of optimism around the subject matter, and I think it definitely helped. Uh, speaking with Fernando, just in terms of going towards the Olympics, that it definitely, it helped. It helped to see that that, that was happening, that they'd be opening up to surfers um, in the Olympics. So it, it, let me bring it back to you, Shane, in terms of, on the, I know we talked about, obviously, the, the training aspect, but would you, would you have to guesstimate that this is obviously going to have an impact on the Olympics and forward with surfing? I think it definitely can, you know, I think it will have a huge impact for all the countries out there. I mean, surfing, everyone knows that it's in the 2020 Olympics in Japan. Yeah. And from what I've heard so far, it's, it's meant to be in the ocean, but that's to be determined Yeah, not even, not, well. not even to maybe utilize the wave in the Olympics, because I think it's almost, a, you know, we've talked about this, it's almost a different, it's apples and oranges. Yeah. But, but also keep in mind, in 2024, it's in Paris, so there's not a lot of... Yeah. Waves in the ocean in Paris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for all the countries, like, once 2020 happens, I think there's going to be a huge opportunity and uh, potential future business for just from so many countries around the world that want to be in the Surf Olympics right. that will start, you know, investing in wave pools and stuff as well. So. And I'm sure you anticipate, too, the Olympics having an impact on future surf parks, right? Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, the Olympics just brings that, that big box media attention to s the sport of surfing and you know hopefully it, it comes out in a way that directly helps our industry in a positive way you know so yeah well permission to speculate like do you I mean do you see wave parks obviously are you gonna I'm, I'm answering the question before you even get to answer it <laughs> no but how do you anticipate the impact globally for the surfing community? I think community? it helps when you when you tie it to the Olympics then it, it may open up some government funding for different countries too I mean if you look at the iFly business model at least in the United States they they create a lot of revenue from government contracts for the military for training yeah. so if you can open up those dollars to where they can help do it to train their Olympic athletes um, you know that just helps the self the surf parks build or you know help grow them well, and, and like I saw, you know, I was there when Seth did the backflip, and he tried yeah. it and tried it and tried it, and Shane was up being wave god, like trying to adjust, yeah. get the wave, get the ramp exactly. That's a, that's a whole new subset, like DJing, <laughs> like you're the wave he DJ. Is. He's like, For sure. yeah, <laughs> it's killer. And then he he then they kept on working on it, working on it, working on it, and then he made it. And he told me like after he goes, dude, that was incredible. It was the best experience of his life. But he learned that flip on that wave, and he can try to take that out into. Uh, any kind of event, Olympics or, yeah. or CT or whatever. So it's, this progression of the athletes is going to be really fast, a lot faster. You, on, on you'll see it go off the charts. And, I mean, Tony can talk about it too. I mean, with Cable Wake Parks, when those came out, you saw these riders that would get more water time wakeboarding and could learn a trick, and it's no different with the surf parks. Right. So you, you didn't have that opportunity before. I mean, how many times did Seth try that? 20, 25 in an hour and a half? That would have yeah. taken him two months to get those many tries out yeah. in the ocean. I, I, would, I, di I would disagree and say it might have taken two to three years. <laughs> it's, 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 exactly. Yeah. I get months. Any, anyone out here that <laughs> yeah. surfs and has looked for an air section? Uh, yeah. um, I agree. I mean, Agreed 100%. The amount of attempts that he got in those two days, like it, it potentially was a three-year Thing that he got 100%, in two days, 100%. you know, and, and that's just that's incredible that, yeah. for the, that? the performance. Yeah, let's 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 bring that up. Like, I mean, we all uh, we've all seen it, us. but well, let's watch it know, again. Out of curiosity, how many of you have seen that video of Seth throwing the backflip in the pool? Wait, how many how have many? not? How many have not seen this? It's gonna be way <laughs> yeah, easier. <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, if all of you have seen it, it doesn't necessarily let's matter. Let's watch it. But no, do it anyway. Yeah, let's get there. Wedging. Yeah. 
<laughs> so sick. So sick. And it actually, you know, it makes me harken back when uh, Volcom, you know, going for the kickflip. Now, it, basically, everything's on the table. Everything's on the table in terms of like what you're going to be able to try to yeah, do. Yeah, I mean, on. just just for me personally, watching Seth do that backflip, I can already see how they're going to be getting more corked and they'll be landing backwards yeah. soon. And and just like I said previously, just being able to have that type of air section, which is an incredible air yeah. section, and you know, it could take years to have that many attempts. And and the attempts that you get in the ocean are so sporadic and like instinctual that you know Seth knowing that he's gonna have that air section already like puts his mind at a, a, a better ease of like knowing yeah. like I'm gonna have in two or three pumps I'm gonna do my flip I think collectively <laughs> I mean I think everyone was a little let down at the WSL event in terms of it didn't really push that envelope even though it, pr it, it promised it was gonna do that but I think if it starts to go that route um, I, I, I think everyone would agree okay, the wave pools are delivering what, what as, we anticipated. As a spectator, it's just going to be great for, for what we can watch or for yeah. the general public. It keep their excitement and just build. It's, it's amazing. And like you said, to know it's going to be there in two or three pumps is something that's never, never been there before. So, yeah. yeah it's, I mean, yeah, I remember the first time I went snowboarding, I, I'm still trying to, you know, fix my shoulder because <laughs> being a surfer, always hunting ramps, you know, pulling yeah. up to the snowboard park is just like, oh, my God, you know, there's just jumps everywhere, you know, and me and my friends, you know, went and wrecked ourselves, and, yeah. but like, this is that of surfing, you know, so I think uh, it's, it's incredible for the progression of the sport. What about the guy yesterday that was talking about Sean White, like he got his own half pipe or whatever yeah. to train for the Pro Olympics? I mean, this the is Project X, where they basically did a, it was a snow half pipe, but then with a foam pit on the bottom of it. So normally, like with BMX or skate, you'd have like, you know, at Woodward, you'd do the, you'd the exactly. resi pits, and then you'd go to the foam pits, and so yeah, it, it's a so game here changer. So it's like, it's the same thing. So whoever's there 50 times, 100 times a day, they're gonna learn a lot of killer yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I, before we run out of time too, I do, I definitely wanna open it up and I'm sure um, you guys have some questions for uh, our panel. Anybody? If we get the... Mike's coming. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm so going to Texas after this. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, all right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, shoot. Uh, turn the mic on, you guys. Should be good. Okay. The mic. Just talk on. loud. We got you. So ways to enhance the uh, business perspective. So like in, in Waco, we, we can have, you know, buses that kids, actually we do already have buses that come and go wakeboarding. So it'd be kind of easy to just get them to go surf too. Right. So we have, so, so there's, you know, buses of, of middle schoolers and high schoolers come to the wave and there's a retail, the surf ride has a store right there. So that's one thing. But then even besides that, even maybe your other retailers that are near Austin, near, you know, inland or near, BSR that maybe don't sell, you know, aren't hip to surf culture right now. Maybe they'll start to get it. And I think they're like, it's hard to say exactly what the opportunities are, but I just know from watching the people learn how to surf and start getting the surf vibe that is right speaking to your brands that there's a ton of uh, upside for getting all these new people that aren't hip to surfing right now to start learning about it and, and being stoked yeah. and having their own stars and maybe becoming you know, pro surfers themselves. I mean, that's a lot of aspiration. It's really, really exciting. I think the brand loyalty is key. I mean, you're getting these surfers coming in, you're gonna get an influx of new surfers that have never been exposed to the products or not been exposed in the same way where now they're actually part of the sport. 
And to, to gain that brand loyalty with these guys, I think is important because you're not just looking at that first surfboard sale or that first t-shirt. It's, it's yeah. your, your lifelong experience. You're getting these 17 year old kids that are going to buy 10, 15 surfboards over their lifetimes, things like that. And to, to have that opportunity with this influx of new people in is, is something that we've never seen. Yeah, before. and as Bobby pointed out too, it's the accessibility, you know, in, in terms of that one's just, where yeah. skateboarding was able to flourish in areas throughout the country, surfing was not. Accessibility, and we talk, I mean, Bobby said with, you know, the ethnicity too, it's an opportunity for markets that, that the surf, surf uh, brands haven't necessarily gone after before, but it's something that, that is very realistic now. And I also think, to your point, Heath, I think these venues can become a, a big interactive kind of stage for brands, you know, like surfboard demos, pop-up retail, fashion shows, photo art galleries. I think, you know, like our vision for Playground Surf, because it's much a, sm a much smaller footprint and area, I just see like kind of these we work environments where, you know, it's white walls, like, you know, how SEMA's up on the wall right now, and it can be traded out for a stance or a, a reef or a rip curl or whatever, and they can come in and do really cool um, activations through these venues that, that may, they may not have been able to do in the ocean, you know, when they're kind of like creating ways to, you know, garnish bigger audiences. Yeah, I feel like you've got this amazing platform where guaranteed surf parks are going to be introducing a ton of new people to surfing and it's an opportunity to associate your brands with that feeling of catching a first wave or having a first surfing experience and the demographic spectrum that's already coming to these places I mean it transcends age nationality culture religion I mean it's a full-on melting pot and people that might be let's say disinclined to try surfing in the ocean whether it's rip currents sharks whatever, whatever they're, you know, afraid of. Not the case in pools. I mean, talk to a, a mom in Kansas who has never let her kids go in the ocean before and she's gonna have 50 different things she's worried about when little six-year-old Jimmy is about to go run out into the ocean. But when they see a pool with a bunch of lifeguards in crystal clear water, it's not that hard of a sell to let mom let Jimmy go surfing. And now all of a sudden it's, you've got tons of new people being introduced to the sport and if your brand's there, when they're learning to surf, I mean, there's a deep connection with that. I mean, I'm going to borrow your example earlier, Blake, was the, the beer. Well, what beer did we drink when we were 16, 17, 18? I still pick up a I natural light and drink 20, it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever I get my hands on. It's the yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like, it's like so cal. yeah. yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, for me, it's about, like, nostalgia to some degree. I mean, that's, I don't drink natural light on a regular basis anymore, but to me, it's like a throwback to 15 years ago when I was chugging beers when my parents didn't know what was going on. I mean, that's, like, you build these connections to brands, and that becomes part of your, your memories, and, and you'll go back to that for a long time. Yeah. So that's a half-baked idea, but... Okay. Um, other questions? Yeah, in the back, Senor Graffi. So uh, mentioned earlier, it's 175 now to go, you know, four to eight hours at Mammoth, depending on what your thirst is. And although that, that seems steep today, it's still a full day of activity. And when you talk about bringing all these kids and talking about bringing moms to your parks, it seems like it's a pretty expensive, or what are you guys doing to address the issue of costs and allowing that many kids being able to come in and experience uh, the waves? Have you, is there a model? Is, there, is it based on sponsorships? Is, it, is, is there a baseline? I guess I'll handle that one. Um, it, it is, you know, it is expensive. We do all kinds of promotions and we try to utilize our off hours where we're not as busy from the general public. Um, to accelerate that process or make it easier for them. Um, I think we can do more of reaching out to other companies that are looking for things, scholarships for summer camps or scholarships for waves, things like that with the schools. Uh, I also mentioned earlier that there's, there's a lot of government grants and things out there that I don't think we've tapped into yet, um, you know, for over obesity and things like that, just for physical activity. And trust me, if you surf at our park and catch 25 waves in your session, it's pretty exhausting by the end of it. Um, it's a great workout. So, there's things like that that I think we can go after. Um, obviously, the parks are very expensive, and they need to keep the doors open and pay the bills, things like that, too. But I think we can help offset that with a lot of different uh, opportunities that are out there that we definitely need to tap into. Yeah, and I, I, at, at BSR Surf Resort, you know, there's also, you can also go down to Lazy River. You can, you know, you can slide down the water slide. You can wakeboard. You can hang out. 
you can drink beer if you're old enough, but you can do all this different stuff. And so it is, so you get at, when you get three waves every, like if we're generating three waves every minute, then you get a lot of waves. And it was incredible, like how tired that you, that you get so fast. So there's a, you're actually surfing quite a bit. So even though it might seem like expensive, it's, it's not that expensive. And then also uh, the community outreach. I think all the parks need to do community outreach and get the kids in there for yeah. a cheaper rate or something. It's like gone down discount. drastically since days of Typhoon Lagoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, have, you used to have to pool together, and you're just like, ugh. Yeah. Um, We're there... very fortunate at Inland. Uh, the owner is Doug Kors, so he's got a lot of connections, and he has, you know, the Kors family has a, a huge philanthropy group. So they have actually, as a family, funded a lot of outside projects and groups to come out to our park that couldn't afford it otherwise, which, again, not everybody has that same luxury, but it's been great to see and, and get different people in there that maybe couldn't afford it without, without the help. Okay. Uh, one more? We... Okay. I have one comment. I think. Okay, sure. As surf parks expand into middle America, and you know, we ta always talk about the wave, is there any strategy to help build beach culture, you know? Because we all grew up surfing, it was about the beach, we're going to surf shops from on the surf wax. What, is there a strategy to help exude what all these brands were built on? I, I, okay, I mean, for us, I mean, at, at BSR Surf Resort, I mean, when I was there, Stu it wasn't open yet, and, and Stuart, the owner, invited like 10 of his, you know, friends with their wives and their kids, and. We're just chilling on the beach, drinking beer and surfing. Some, a lot of his friends had never surfed before, so I'm helping him, like pushing him in on foamies and longboarding with them and whatever. And I went onto the sand and I'm looking out and I swear to God, I felt like I was at Cardiff on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. It was exactly like being at Cardiff. So I feel like there is like an opportunity to, to, to do that. You just gotta, I mean, what I want everyone to do here is, you know, you guys need to go to Texas. You all need to go check it out. You need to surf it inland, you know, for a couple days. Go to Austin and party. Come to Waco and surf for a couple days. Stay in the cabins and have fun and check it out. And and you'll you'll uh, figure it out. And also to help you do that, um, uh, BSR Surf Resort is giving everybody at, here at SEMA their first hour of surfing for free. What? So whoever comes, <laughs> bravo, <laughs> bravo. <laughs> I knew there was some way I could get some applause. Yeah, there, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Lift tickets or surfing, you're gonna get, you're gonna get friends for sure. Yeah. Uh, on that same note, I mean, we had a fear and, and we got a call from the mayor of Port Aransas, which is a Texas surf town south of us. And, and he was a surfer and concerned that we were just gonna create kooks by the thousands that didn't understand. So, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it's true. I mean, the call's from the mayors. But anyway, <laughs> we, uh, we try to educate all of our surf guides come from ocean surfing and that's their fear was real too. So we've created, you know, literature that helps understand the difference between inland and the ocean and, and the right way to surf out in the ocean because that was a huge, huge deal with us when we first opened, a huge concern of the locals. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, John. You go ahead first. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, you know, like um, just, just staying true and incorporating the, the, the real roots of this culture of surf. You know, I think each venue, if they embrace that and, and you guys as industry leaders, get involved and embrace it as well, then I think, you know, there'll be a, a great portrayal of, of the core ocean surf as it moves inland. Yeah, I feel like the room that we have here, I mean, it's an amazing group of minds and, and it's, it's just an open question. I mean, how do you bring some of the best elements of surfing and beach culture to places that have never been or exposed to, you know, any part of surfing? And to me, surfing is so much more than just riding waves. And what surfing embodies and how the outside, call it people outside the surf world, see it. I mean, surfing encompasses this healthy, active lifestyle. And I think that can be played up in big ways. And it's, it's got to be one of the sexiest sports in the world to market, period. And I think it, it should be something that, you know, the conversation should go beyond this room and this panel today. And all of you in here can contribute to that. And I think it's... You know, all of us are probably super interested to hear your thoughts and your brand's ideas on how to integrate you all into these parks and make sure they don't become, you know, Cowabunga Bay. Like, that's, that's <laughs> not what we want. Yeah. So. yeah, lots of opportunity, a chance to go uh, uh, way broader, and, uh, and just the diversity aspect really opens up some, uh, some interesting discussions. So how about a round of applause for our great panel, you guys? Yeah. Thank you. Good job,
Tony, Don.